I wonder if, uh, before I begin my talk, you might join me in a little prayer for all those affected by the coronavirus. Um, I'll say a prayer if you don't mind in Hebrew and then in English. Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Moshe, Aaron, David, Shlomo, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Velea, Uyuvarech, Virape, et Kola Cholim, Ben Be Coronavirus, Ben Besha Machalot, Vachol Haumot, Vachol Haratzot, Vavu Shanachnu mit Palalim, Lachlama Tam, Bishazea, Kanish Borchu, Yumale Rachamim, Lehem Lachli Mamul Rapal Tam, Lahazikam, Ulachiotam, Yishlach Lehem Mehera, Rufua Shlema Mina Shemaimim, Kol Cholei Olam, Rufua Tanefesh, Rufua Taguf, Ashtaba Galavizman Kariv Venoma, Amen. God of life, who delights in life and teaches us to choose and sanctify life, hear and heed our prayers as we pray for those infected by the coronavirus along with all the other sick and afflicted of the world. Send them healing, grant them strength, and help them to make a full recovery that they and we may give honor to your name. Amen. Amen. Um, friends, I will come back to that right at the end of my talk, but in between times, let's change the subject, do you mind? Um, and invite you to join me on a little journey as to why I undertook to write this book and what I discovered along the way. And let me begin by saying that it's always a little risky when you undertake a book, you never know who or how you are going to offend. My favorite story was told by, um, told to us actually, Elaine and myself, by uh, Alan Dershowitz, you know, the Harvard lawyer, who uh, is a very secular Jew, but whose uncle is a very, very religious Jew. And on one occasion, Alan wrote a book about law and justice in the Bible called The Genesis of Justice, and thought he would send it to his uncle, who might be pleased that he'd been occupying himself with the holy book. He waited for four weeks and then phoned up his uncle and said, Uncle, how did you like the book? And his uncle replied, there's only one word I'd like you to change. And Alan said, which word? And his uncle replied, Dershowitz. <laughs> so you never know, but there you are. So a little journey in five stages. The journey began in 2016. I don't know if you remember 2016, the most divisive American presidential election in history, and one of the most divisive issues, the Brexit vote in England. And I was wondering, what is going on here? Um, for instance, do you remember those extraordinary years, 2016 to 2019, when we were yes, no, hard, soft, now, not now, where the entire British government seemed unable to make its own mind whether to vote for itself or not? This was not politics as usual. In fact, I don't know if you know about the... There's a Jewish university in America, in New York, I was a professor there recently, called Yeshiva University. And one year, Yeshiva University lost all its rowing matches. It decided, we, we can't carry on like this, we've got to find out what we're doing wrong. And so they sent their coach to Harvard to look at their rowing team. The coach came back three days later, shell-shocked. And he told the team, you wouldn't believe it. They do exactly the opposite of what we do. They have eight people rowing and only one person shouting instructions. <laughs> well, I never thought uh, the British government would look like the Yeshiva University rowing team. And that was the first thing that got me concerned. The second thing that got me concerned was the sheer divisiveness of American politics. I don't know if you've followed, but last week a 
survey came out saying that 45% of Americans will no longer talk politics to a friend or a member of their family because they're worried that it will degenerate immediately and they'll lose the friend or the relationship within the family. I asked a friend of mine who lives in Washington, very bright political analyst, what it was like living through that particular presidential election. And he replied, well, it was like the man standing on the deck of the Titanic holding in his hand a glass of whiskey and saying, I know I asked for ice. <laughs> but this is ridiculous. So the first question I asked was, why has politics suddenly become dysfunctional. The second question I asked was, why has economics become so dysfunctional? As you know, we are in one of the most extraordinary periods of economic inequality in living memory. JP Morgan of the bank that bears his name said that the relationship between, the ratio between a CEO and the lowest paid employee in a company should be 20 to 1. And in 1965, that is what it was, 20 to 1. Now, 312 to 1. And I think it was last, last week that Bob Iger stepped down as CEO of Disney. And in 2018, his, his uh, financial package was 1,424 times the median salary of a Disney employee. Now, how did this happen? This is not something that uh, I, you know, that somebody like me alone is concerned about. Ray Dalio, head of Bridgewater Capital, which is the world's largest hedge fund, said last year, that economic inequality in the United States is a national emergency and an existential risk to the future of America. And that was said by the 57th wealthiest person on the planet. So how did economics become so dysfunctional, so inequi inequitable? Thirdly, I don't know if you noticed, again, just before everything was, as it were, displaced by the virus, but there was a very troubling news item just two or three weeks ago that for the first time in a century, life expectancy has ceased to increase. So it's, it's now static. And for the poorest section of the population, it is actually decreasing, decreasing both in Britain and in America. And this is really extraordinary because the story of the last hundred years has been of an unbroken increase in life expectancy. How did this happen? And of course, one of the reasons it's happened, there are many reasons. There's poverty, there's the austerity program, cutbacks in social services, but not least is the fact that among those whose life expectancy is declining, there is a growth of isolation and loneliness in parts of the country. And loneliness, I mean, after all, in 2018, for the first time in history, Britain appointed a so-called minister for loneliness. It never existed before. And the question is, how did this happen all of a sudden? But the effect of it happening is simple. That loneliness is as harmful to health as obesity or smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So those things, I wondered what is happening to health and to social life that we have seen this sudden rise in loneliness. And fourthly, something that you may have been following keeps coming up in the news, the assault on freedom of speech in universities. D did you notice last week 
Selena Todd, an Oxford professor, and Amber Rudd, were actually barred from speaking at a conference in Exeter College, Oxford. And this is happening again and again and again. Um, the Canadian psychologist Jordan Peterson was debarred from having a fellowship at the Cambridge Divinity School last summer. And, and so on and so forth. We, we are seeing people like Germaine Greer, the feminist, people like Peter Tatchell, the gay, gay activist, being barred from universities on the grounds that they must, since they care about women's rights and gay rights, be transphobic. What is happening here? I don't think this is something that can be taken lightly. In 1927, a French intellectual, Julian Bender, wrote a book, a famous a book with a very famous title, called Le Trahison d'Eclair, The Betrayal of the Intellectuals. I say the book title is famous because the book itself is fairly unreadable. Um, <laughs> but there is one wonderful phrase in it in which he says that universities used to be places with high ideals, now they become places for the intellectual organization of political hatreds. Now, he wrote that in 1927. Within six years, universities were throwing out, for instance, every Jewish academic. And nobody was protesting. So, when there is the beginning of an assault on freedom of speech at universities, we know things are going very badly wrong. So, those phenomena and many, many others started concerning me in the past four years. Why are they suddenly appearing now? The political divisiveness, the economic inequality, the loneliness, the assault on freedom of speech, and so on. And what I wanted to do was to ask, are these separate phenomena, or are they all part of a single phenomenon? So for instance, if you think about uh, global warming, um, climate change, how does, that, uh, how does that express itself? The fascinating thing is it expresses itself in all sorts of contradictory ways. Last summer, they had unprecedented heat in Australia, hence all the fires. They had unprecedented cold in Delhi, in India. In some places, climate change expresses itself in terms of drought. In other places, flooding and inundation. But they are all part of a single phenomenon, namely climate change. I wanted to know if the four phenomena and the many others I deal with in the book are part of the same phenomenon the way climate changes. And after several years of really thinking hard about it and researching it, I came to the conclusion that they are all linked and they are expressions of what I call cultural climate change. And that is what the book is all about. What happened to our culture to make this sudden change in the way we relate to one another? And here it is. Number one, let me ex show you what, 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 what I think is the, the big difference. Number one, have you noticed all the words that suddenly came into force in the last two generations? Um, let me ask you, what do we worship collectively nowadays? Pardon? Celebrities. What? Celebrities. Celebrities. Yeah, well, see, we worship celebrities, except when we sacrifice them on the altar of not being a celebrity anymore. Um, but my, my, since we don't worship God, we don't worship nationality, we don't worship race, we don't worship religion, I think one candidate I put forward is as follows. Think of the words that are the buzzwords of our time. Self-fulfillment, self-realization, self-actualization, self-respect, self-esteem. What is the religious ritual of our time? The selfie. 
So, that is my starting point, number one. Number two, there is this fantastic thing. Um, has anyone ever tried this? It's called a Google Engram. Anyone know what a Google Engram is? Google have digitized entire literatures. Among them, everything ever published in Britain and America since 1800. And you can do a search for the instance of any word throughout the entire literature for a given period of time. And Professor Robert Putnam of Harvard University did a Google engram and followed, discovered the following, that if you look at the ratio between the words we and I, they remain fairly steady until 1964, when suddenly the word I begins to dominate over the word we. And that is the beginning, not the full extent of it, but the beginning of this cultural climate change. Less emphasis on we, more emphasis on I. And the same applies, because another American professor has done this research exercise, to pop songs over the same period. Pop songs used to be about us and together and love and all sorts of stuff. And today, slightly gloomier. I mean, there's a fairly long trajectory between Simon and Garfunkel and Eminem. Would you agree? <laughs> so all of a sudden, you know, again, that move from the we to the I is something you find in pop music as well. And that is... Extraordinary. So I realized that that was the nature of the climate change, less we, more I. That's stage two. Stage three, I asked, does this matter? Why should it be important? And that is where I suddenly realized the significance of the Darwin problem. Do you know the Darwin problem? Let me, let me give you a simple way into the Darwin problem. Have you seen The Imitation Game? Yeah, do you know the film? Benedict Cumberbatch playing Alan Turing with a, and Alan Turing is not, is, did not score high on emotional intelligence, so Kiera Knightley, the well-known mathematician, <laughs> suggests to Alan Turing, alias Benedict Cumberbatch, tell them a joke. So he tells his team who are trying to crack the Enigma code a joke. And this is the joke he tells them. Two explorers are in the jungle when they hear the roar of a lion. One of them, the first one, immediately starts searching for a place where they can be safe. The second one starts putting on his running shoes. The first one says to the second one, you're crazy, you can't run faster than a lion. And the second one says to the first one, I don't need to run faster than the lion, I just need to run faster than you. <laughs> now, which of the two survived? The one who is self-interested and only thinking about himself, or the first one who's the altruist who wants to save both of them. It is the self-interested one, the egoist who survives, and the altruist who doesn't. This is what bothered Charles Darwin. Darwin realized that if natural selection is the whole story, and that everything that lives is in competition with everything else for scarce resources, the altruist should go extinct. As he put it, those who ri take risk their lives for the sake of others will die disproportionately young. And therefore, no altruism, altruist should be left. But Darwin knew that in every society he had ever come across, Altruists were admired, as was altruism. 
And this really bothered him because it threatened to undermine his entire theory. Until he came up with the solution, which is this. Any group, think of two groups. One group in which everyone's an altruist, prepared to take risks for the sake of the group. And another group in which everyone's an egoist, only concerned with their own interests. Which group wins? The altruists win because they're the stronger group. Or imagine a football team of 11 divas. They can be brilliant footballers, but they're never going to win a match because they don't put the team ahead of the self. So Darwin realized that natural selection is in fact quite a complex thing because we need to be able to compete, but we need to be able to cooperate as well with the members of our group. Or as we would put it today, we pass on our genes as individuals, but we survive as members of groups. So we need to cooperate as well as compete. Is that clear? When we compete, we're thinking about I. When we cooperate, we're thinking about we. Darwin understood, and this has now become the subject of major research in uh, sociobiology, evolutionary psychology, and game theory, what they call the evolution of cooperation. Huge amount of research has been done on that in the last 40 years. And any group needs to be able to compete and to cooperate. It needs the I and it needs the we. And now I want to suggest what has gone wrong in the liberal democracies of the West in the past period of time. We have believed that all you need to have to sustain a free society is two things. A market economy and a democratic state. That's all you need. And that has been a colossal mistake. Because if you think about it, a market economy and a democratic state are both about competition. The market economy is about competition for wealth, and the democratic state is about the competition for power. And those things are important and necessary and really, really essential. But some, something is missing. And I want you to see this by way of a very simple thought experiment. If you have a thousand pounds and you decide to share it with nine others, how much do you have left? You have a hundred pounds. What, one tenth of what you began with. If you have total power, like the synagogue president who said, all those in favor say I, all those against say I resign. If you have total power and you decide to share that with nine others, how much do you have left? One-tenth of what you began with. Now, tell me this. If you have a certain amount of knowledge or influence or love and you share that with nine others, how much do you have? Do you have less? You have more. Why? Because... Wealth and power are, in the short term, zero-sum games. The more I share, the less I have. But love or influence or knowledge or friendship are social goods. And those social goods, the more I share, the more I have. They are not zero-sum games. They're non-zero. They multiply. Why? Because they are the arenas, not of competition, but of cooperation. And where do you find them? You find them in families, in communities, in congregations, in charities, in voluntary associations, in all of those places. You are not a lonely self in pursuit of self-interest. You are a member of the family, the community. You care about the we. And that is what makes a family or a community. You are there for others. They are there for you. They are the way in which we become literate in the 
emotions and the habits of the heart that constitute morality. Morality is what happens when we subordinate self-interest to the common good, where we care about others, not just ourselves. And those places are the places where we speak the emotional and practical language of we. What has happened over the last 50 years has been a weakening of families and communities and everything associated, and congregations for that matter. Why? For three, it came in three waves. Number one was the social revolution of the 1960s, in which we said, forget about a shared moral code. Morality is whatever works for you. Then came the 1980s and the economic revolution, Thatcherism, Reaganomics, where this was never the intention, but the result was, I don't know if you can remember that far back, Michael Douglas in Wall Street, wearing those wonderful red braces and saying in so many words, greed is good. Suddenly economics became about the pursuit of self-interest and not just and not the interests of the group as a whole. And then finally came the technological revolution of our time, smartphones and social media, which are all about the presentation of self, about my Facebook profile. They, it's all about me selling myself. And the combination of those three revolutions unprecedented in their power and their proximity, has tilted the balance of our society away from the we to the I, and the result is our arenas of competition, the market economy and the democratic state are fine, they're strong, but the we that brings us together in cooperation, not competition, that has grown very weak. How does that play out? in the four areas that I mentioned, politics, economics, and so on. Well, have you noticed how politics has stopped being about policies and become about personalities? Did you notice that? And in that kind of politics, the most effective thing you can possibly do is character assassination of your opponents. And when you do that, it's the person with the strongest ego who wins. And the message is, vote for me. Not vote for this party or that policy or that vision, but vote for me. That is what happens when the we becomes the I in politics. What happens when the we becomes the I in economics? There was a man, I, mean, I wonder if anyone remembers the name, Arnold Weinstock. Arnold Weinstock was for four decades um, the leading industrialist in Britain. He built up GEC to be an enormous, enormous company. And he was the textbook example that everyone wrote about in the 1990s. You wanted a successful industrialist. He was the, he was the ideal. Three months before he died, he phoned me up and said, I'd like to come and see you. And he came to see me. He was a broken man. And he told me the following. He told me how he'd built up GEC. And he told me, how much he paid himself. And he adhered to the 20 to 1 rule. He felt that's what a CEO is paid. He said to me, my successor is paying himself 10 times what I paid myself and is destroying everything I built. If you look up the history of GEC, you will see that that is exactly what happened. And I suddenly realized when I had that conversation, what was happening? Because Alan Weinstock was 
a we person. He cared about the company that he was building, not just his shareholders, not just the profit and loss accounts. He cared about his employees. He cared about his customers. He cared about the communities in which his factories were set. He cared about all of that. But when he left, his successor was already inhabiting another kind of world, not a we, but an I approach to economics. And that is unsustainable. Luckily, some serious human beings that are proposing a different way of doing economics. So Ronald Cohen, creator, one of the first venture capitalists in Britain, and one of the most successful, uh, who was asked by Gordon Brown when Gordon Brown was prime minister to be head, the head of the first social bank, uh, social capital bank in Britain, is, has been persuading over this last couple of years G7 and now working on G20 to accept a new kind of economics called impact economics, in which a company is to be valued not only by its profit and loss account, but by a precisely quantified account of its impact on the environment. And he's worked out, I mean, he's got expert economists to work out the algorithms that will do this. Raghuram Rajan was the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund. And he is proposing something called social economics, in which economic policies of the World Bank and of, world, of, 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 of the global economy be based not only on profit and loss, but on impact on communities. Are they enhancing or are they destroying communities? So here you have two. One really successful venture capitalist and one outstanding economist saying there is a way of bringing the we back into economics and looking at companies to benefit not only, the, um, not only the company itself and its shareholders, but the people affected by it. Number three, um, universities and freedom of speech. Have you been following the logic of banning people? Um, the logic of banning people from universities. I'll tell you how it happened, and I'll tell you the answer to it. It happened because I was actually a philosophy student back in the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, and the leading moral philosophy of the time was called emotivism. And emotivism said that morality isn't really an objective science. What it is is an expression of your feelings. So when you say X is good, what you're saying is I like X. Now what happens when you believe that? The first thing that happens is you can no longer have a moral argument anymore uh, because you like tea, I like coffee. There's not a lot to argue about. So how do you win an argument? The short answer is this. You win an argument by saying, morality is about feelings. You are just upsetting my feelings. Once you've said that, then you've defined yourself as the victim. It follows that the other person is the victimizer, and therefore you can ban the other person as, the, as a victimizer. That's how we got to where we are. Now, what's the solution to it? Universities are calling places where you won't hear something distressing to you safe space. I think the meaning of safe space should be exactly the opposite. And I re the reason I say this is because my doctoral supervisor was a philosopher called Sir Bernard Williams. Bernard Williams was known as the cleverest man in England and was probably the greatest philosopher of his time. He was a lapsed Catholic and a wonderfully, wonderfully brilliant atheist. I mean, a serious atheist. You know, we just don't have atheists of that quality anymore, I'm afraid. 
And here I am wearing my thing, you know, my yarmulke, and quite religious, and the world's most brilliant atheist. And we're sitting in his room in King's, and in all our encounters, never once did he rubbish or ridicule my opinions. All he ever asked was that I be coherent and consistent. I found that the most extraordinarily liberating experience. Here is a man who listened respectfully to my views, even though they were diametrically opposed to his own, and I realized that that's what a university is. It's a place where you listen respectfully to the people who disagree with you in the knowledge that they will re listen respectfully to you. And that meant that I could go out into the world confident that despite the fact that 99% of the people I meet might disagree with me, nonetheless, we can be respectful to one another. That was safe space. But if you incubate people and say, we will never let you hear something that's going to upset you, you have rendered them totally vulnerable when they leave the university. Because they're completely unprepared for a world of diverse views unlike their own. So that is how you deal with universities. You allow them to be places of civil disagreement. After all, Judaism is a place of uncivil disagreement. Um, other people have conversations. We only have arguments. But that is how you learn to cope with the world, to be able to argue with one another and to encounter and not be faced by the realization that not everyone agrees with you. And that is fine. And finally, you know, in terms of loneliness, we have just got to have the courage to say that families matter, that communities matter, and we have to rebuild them. I had the great privilege being asked by Gordon Brown at the time to help him launch his Child Poverty Action Program. Because the breakdown of marriage in Britain meant that there were, even in an age of affluence, 3.4 million children living below the poverty line. And all of that poverty, almost all of it, came not from economics, but from the social breakdown and the multiplication of single-parent families. And I don't want to stigmatize anyone, but it does seem to me that... You can do this kind of thing if you care enough about it. It's not easy. Does anyone remember a Secretary of State for the Environment back in the 1990s called John Sel Selwyn Gummer? John Selwyn Gummer on one occasion invited George Carey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, um, um, the, late the late Basil Hume, Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, and myself, for lunch. And we were trying to guess why he was inviting us for lunch. Uh, we, we weren't even close. Because over lunch he said, because of the breakdown of marriage, I'm going to have to build an extra 400,000 housing units in the south of Eng southeast of England because more people are living on their own. We need more marriage. Can't you do something about it? I've never heard such an expression of faith in religious <laughs> leaders before. It was terrific. But, I mean, I think we can do something about it. But, first of all, we have to decide that we want to. And so we can strengthen families and communities. We can make the economy much more equitable. We can make politics more about service than about self and we can make universities places that are robust but intellectually open. And we can do all this if we are willing to take the we seriously. That an essential element of our being is the I. We're all individuals, we're all different, and that matters and it counts. But we're also social animals. And the we really, really matters. And therefore, we have to be able to conceive of places as communities, as communities of diversity. 
A university is a community. An economy is, <clears throat> is set in the midst of communities that it can strengthen or weaken. Politics is about a national community. And all of these things need a recovery of the we and slightly less emphasis on the I. And this, therefore, is what I hope you might consider if you have a chance to read the book. It's this simple. Do a search and replace operation in your mind. And whenever you find the word self, delete and insert the word other. So instead of self-esteem, other esteem. Instead of self-respect, other respect. And you will find that your whole life is turned outward. You will feel better. Those around you will certainly feel better. And you will have begun to change the world. Friends, I said I would just end by a little word about the coronavirus situation. The situation is, of course, really disturbing. Nothing like it in my lifetime, in our lifetime. I think, first and foremost, we have to be thankful that the speedy action on behalf of most countries in the world will mean, hopefully, that the impact will be nothing like the terrible pandemics of the past. The Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 to 1920, which cost between 20 million and 50 million lives. The HIV AIDS um, pandemic of 2005 to 2012, which took 36 million lives. Hopefully, the sheer reliance on medical expertise will make sure that this one is much less damaging and will tell us that despite everything, we do make progress in civilization. I think the 2008 financial crisis was horrendous, but it was nothing like the 1929 Great Crash and the subsequent depression that caused misery and poverty throughout the 1930s. So little by little, we get better at these things. But in terms of the we-I distinction that I've been making, I think we've seen this playing out very clearly. Number one, there has been hoarding and stockpiling at, uh, and emptying of shelves at supermarkets. And everyone who does that is putting the I ahead of the we and saying, you know, I will have more than I need despite the fact that I may be taking away from people who have less than they need. And that is a victory of I over we and it's dangerous. A second victory of I over we was very dangerous was, you remember a few days ago, Italy put 16 million people into quarantine in the north of Italy. But as soon as that news was heard, tens of thousands of people tried to escape to the south of Italy, putting their own personal convenience over the safety of others. And the result was that Italy had to lock down the whole of Italy and not just the north. And that was another bad instance of I triumphing over we. Thirdly, I'm afraid I have to say that the whole relationship of the West to one another has not been good. I think the American ban on travel from Europe was done without any consultation with the leaders of Europe and constituted a failure of moral leadership. When all that matters to a politician is I, then you get that kind of chaos in which everyone suffers. So we have seen too much I and too little we do great damage in the last few days and weeks. 
What do I hope to emerge from this when we come out of this very, very difficult period? Number one, I hope we'll understand that there is such a thing as a covenant of global responsibility. Here we all are, across the world, in every single country, suffering the same fate and the same danger and the same risks. We are a global we, and this is showing, it, showing us is nothing else has in our time. We are part of a global we, the we of humanity. Secondly, one tiny little microscopic virus can bring the whole world to its knees. Despite all our technological and scientific advance, I hope that teaches us the we of humility as well. If we have humility, maybe we'll take more care of the environment and let it'll be a little less anthropocentric and willing to understand that we are a small part of this planet and we better take care of it as a whole. And thirdly, I really want to thank you all for, do, for coming out here this evening. I mean, it's very moving. It really is very moving. But when this is all over, I want you to think of all those hundreds of thousands of people around the world who've endured quarantine and self-imposed isolation, sitting on their own, lonely eyes, and understand what a gift it is at normal times to be able to come together, to sit together, to shake one another's hand. Let us realize what a gift it is of being together as a we, not just as isolated eyes. And that will be our redemption of solitude. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat>
have a particular role within the family dynamic. Are you with me? And families get used to dynamics, um, that each member of the family has a certain role to play. And she realized that if she wanted children to lose his stammer, they had to renegotiate all the relationships within the family. She had to turn families into fluid and growth-oriented places. And uh, she did extraordinary things. She worked out that you had to be able to do the following things. Number one, it's scary to change. Even if you've got a stammer, it's scary to lose it because it's scary to lose anything. You've built it into your self-image. So how do you get kids not to be scared? And this is the solution she came to. Everyone in the family had to praise others in the family every single day for one simple thing that they did. Because when you have praise within a family, everyone feels good and confident and they're able to change. She realized that you have to learn how to listen. Because a stammering child takes time to get a sentence out, so everyone in the family has to learn how to listen. She realized that in the family, you have to learn how to negotiate. Because otherwise you have rows, right? I want to go, you know, I don't want to go to bed, etc. You, you get rid of all the rows by teaching everyone in the family how to negotiate. She taught them how to uh, collectively problem solve. Because people in a family can get stuck in a particular, you know, they, they only have one solution to a problem. As somebody once said to someone with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So she taught them how, as a family, to solve problems together. And she taught them also how to make contracts together. Those five skills, I suddenly realized, were not just skills that help stammering children. They helped everyone. Because I made a documentary program about our work for the BBC, and I was get, visiting families, and one after the other, I would ask, did Lena solve your, cure your child's stammer? And one after the other, they would say, oh, yeah, sure, she cured our child's stammer. But more importantly, she saved our marriage. <laughs> and I, I suddenly realized there's something amazing about this, these techniques. I had, for the only time in my life, a dysfunctional camera crew. They were bickering the whole time. And they spent one evening filming Lena teaching parents, standing in a circle, to give and receive praise. Now, it's quite hard for some people to give praise. For other people, it's quite hard to receive praise. Oh, it was, it was nothing. It was, you know, and she'd say, oh, they were giving you a present and you just threw it away. And I suddenly realized that these five techniques that she was teaching five-year-old children were sufficient to keep and sustain relationships for a lifetime. And they were stunning, and they were taught by game playing, so there was no moral judgment. So, you know, nobody was saying, get married, okay, they're only five-year-old kids. Um, but these were incredible techniques, and they were life-changing. I mean, oh, sorry, I forgot to say about the camera crew. They spent one evening filming Lena teaching parents to give and receive praise. The next day, they started praising one another. <laughs> And all the acrimony vanished. It disappeared. They suddenly all started loving each other. I mean, it was crazy. So I sat with three consecutive secretaries of state for education, telling them this story and saying, please, it's worth doing one little pilot project. I did not succeed with any of, any of those secretaries of state for education. But this I can guarantee you. We can teach children of five years old to become we people in a way that will make them happier for life. And it is so simple and it breaks my 
part, but we're not yet doing it. Thank you. Yeah. Who else would like to ask a question? Don't be shy. A uh, gentleman at the front. Uh, Rabbi Sachs, you, you mentioned um, in terms of learning, loneliness and the, and the uh, social climate change, the breakdown of family, very important, going back to the 60s, etc. Um, there's obviously been a lot of social change. And in terms of trying to recover that, what do we mean now by family? Because the traditional nuclear family is very broken. And whilst individual relationships perhaps could improve they're not going to come back in the way they used to be. So what do you mean in the 21st century, in 2020, by family? And what is it that can be done to try and recover a sense of family, given that we have blended families, we have gay families, there's all sorts of different types of family, very different to the one you're perhaps suggesting uh, is the type that, whose breakdown has, has led to some of the problems you've outlined? I'm, I'm very non-prescriptive on that. I don't think you can get up and say one particular model of family work is going to work for everyone in a society as diverse and complex as ours. I think it is incredibly important not to load people with a, a burden of guilt because your view of what makes a marriage is different from their view. So I feel very, very non-judgmental about how you do it. But I do commend to you a, very, a long but very interesting article in the Atlantic Monthly in, in the States. You get it on, online by David Brooks this month or last month. David Brooks of the New York Times. The argument of which is the nuclear family isn't it anymore. We need extended families. We need blended families. We need, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very powerful case because he does feel the nuclear family is not strong enough. It's, be, it's fractured and it just isn't. So please, he says it so much better than I can. Um, and, uh, but there it is, to, to, to come together. Well, you know, Sorry, this disclosure here. I know Barry from way, way back, and uh, but Barry, you know the you know the answer. One answer is that you have to generalise from our experience. We've just had a festival called Purim. We're just running up to a festival called Pesach. You have festivals. You come together. Um, I was very interested that somebody just did a profile. The Irish Catholic. I don't know who the. You've seen this of the of the book, and and the the priest, the journalist, the Irish journalist who came into our house. The first thing he noted, most people notice, it's full of books. He completely ignored the books. He said, the first thing I noticed is a big dining table. And I suddenly realised that not everyone has a dining table anymore. So, the family that eats together stays together. That is my theory. And I think you have to create celebrations, moments, when you eat together and you celebrate together. And the exact form of the family, I am not going to prescribe. Okay? Thank you. Okay. Uh, who else would like to ask a question? Uh, the lady at the front here. such a risk-averse world that we live in that we're frightened to even push anything anymore. We're kind of cocooning them and wrapping them up. I mean, I do a lot of work with Prevent, and the teachers now won't even talk about, um, are too scared to talk about radicalisation or anything within the school because they're frightened that they might be seen as radicalising young people. And what young people are saying to me is, we want to discuss it, we want to talk about it, but we, 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 there's just no space. It's a bit more used about the, the, the safe spaces that I was thinking about. But there isn't a space that they can do that because the teachers are scared, the 
young people are scared to talk about it. I just wondered, I know it's kind of different to what you talk about, whether it fits in at all or one of the issues. The answer is peanuts. Let me explain. Kids today, lots of kids, have peanut allergies. No Israeli kid has peanut allergies. Why? Because the most popular snack for Israeli kids has peanuts in it. So once you expose kids to it, they become immune to the allergy. Now, if you're risk-averse, you never let a kid anywhere near a peanut, and the end result is they all have peanut allergies. In other words, risk-aversion creates risk. It doesn't cure risk. If you can't talk about radicalization, you will get radicalization. So being risk-averse is a self-destructive tray to have. And the end result is that you have to have sufficient trust in people to realize that if you tell them something that's difficult, they can handle it. And therefore, you should be averse to risk aversion. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just here, uh, Thank you very much for the talk. Um, the, the idea of that people, individuals, are, are very lonely and reaching out for a grander we um, really resonated with me. But what about when some of those we communities are built on, on hatred or on irrationality? Because I would think that, you know, some of the identity politics around supporters of Donald Trump in the States, for instance, are built around hatred as a common we. Um, and how would you respond to people who build community around <clears throat> those things? It's a really, really good question. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I wrote a book about it called uh, <laughs> Not in God's Name, in which I argue that our groupishness is the source of a great deal of comfort and strength, but it's also a source of conflict and hatred. It really is. And that's why it's terribly important always to go for the largest possible we, right? In other words, the simplest way I put it is the team is always bigger than the player, but the game is bigger than the team, yeah? So we're all part of teams. Uh, it, it could be the white supremacist team or, or whatever, you know. It's very, very important to realize the game is bigger than the team. When you lose sight of the game, the end result is you have a lot of teams that turn into hostile tribes. Now, it so happens that we have lost a sense of national identity. We have, and America has. I was astonished to discover that America had. I was given an award in, in Kennedy Center in Washington, and I made a little speech about how America does identity so much better than Britain does, because America tells the American story. You just walk around Washington, and you can't fail to see it. You know, have you ever walked around Washington? You see the memorials? You know what, what, what it says on the Lincoln Memorial? The Lincoln Memorial, one, on one wall, the Gettysburg Address. On the other wall, the second inaugural. You go to the Jefferson Memorial, that, that Apollonian Greek theater, and you've got screeds of text. You look at the Roosevelt Memorial, it's got six chambers for the six decades in which he was in public life, and in each case, the key sentences from those decades, and that is, uh, you know, we have nothing to fear except fear itself, etc., etc. The Martin Luther King Memorial, which has more than a dozen quotes from, from Martin Luther King, brilliant, brilliant things. So in Washington, 
Memorials are something you read. You go to Parliament Square in London. Do you know how many words on the statue for David Lloyd George? Three. David Lloyd George. <laughs> Nelson Mandela gets two. Nelson Mandela. Churchill, who wrote some of the most unforgettable sentences in all of literature, one. Churchill, that's it. So in, in London, monuments are something you see. In Washington, monuments are something you read because they tell a story, the American story. So I said, in Washington, you tell the story and we don't, and so you've got a stronger identity. When I got down from the stage, they all came up to me and said, we used to tell the story. We've stopped telling it. Why? Because, you know, there's a sense of national shame about treatment of uh, indigenous peoples and all the rest of it. Not, not wrong to have that shame. But you have to tell the story. Indeed, I don't know if you've seen this, but a brilliant uh, guy from a Puerto Rican family called Lin Manuel Miranda showed us a new way of telling the national story completely in a musical called Hamilton. You know, we don't have an English equivalent of that, but Hamilton is a brilliant way of casting against type ethnically and religiously and, and using music that's blended, but a lot of rap music there. You know? So as soon as America stopped telling the story, it lost the game and all it had was teams. And that's when you got identity politics, which is bad politics. It's politics of one minority against another. And so you had the Democrats ticking off their boxes, you know, and then you had Donald Trump's supporters ticking off the disenfranchised male inhabitants of the flyover states. In other words, you lose that national story, you are going to get society crumbling from within into hostile tribes. And that's a bad place to be. I've been arguing for years now, for years, for a way of telling the British story. And it's doable. And you know who did it? Danny Boyle in the 2012, you remember the opening ceremony of the London Olympics? He showed what it is to be British. There the, are the hundred ways of showing it. But he showed it could be done with panache and with humor and so on. Because without it, we see Brexit splitting the country into two. And we forget, what are we doing this for and who are we? So I think your question is a really, really good question. But it's a soluble one. And we must solve it without ever forgetting the distinction made by George Orwell between patriotism and nationalism. Nationalism is dangerous, have nothing to do with it. But patriotism, pride in who we are, without putting down other nations and other cultures, that is something real, something important, and that is the greater we. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Jonathan Sachs.